Is my screen breaking? No. Okay. Yes, now we are live. Okay, Shoma. Uh, now we are live. It's it's visible in uh, YouTube. Okay, now I will start recording. Uh, just a minute. Yes, your screen is a little bit different right now. Breaking, yes. I can see it. Why is it? No, but it, it goes. It's, it depends on the internet. Okay, okay. so should I, should I start? Yes, yes. Go yes. Ahead. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for once again joining our bioengine plant science webinar series. Uh, today we're very happy that uh, not only the eminent scientists in this field, also we able to bring another crop is uh, uh, very common to our everyday life, but uh, it's a lot of research on that is potato. So I am very happy to uh, ask, uh, because that uh, Mohanty sir accept our invitations and uh, from your from his busy schedules he can manage our time for bioengine webinar. As you know, everyone that the bioengine uh, uh, webinar uh, after the webinar we will share a link for feedback and certificate applications. Those are already registered. Please use your registered email ID for the participant certificate, and it will be available after three days from our website, bioengine.com. Uh, Shoma will introduce the, a, a little bit about bioengine and the speaker, and then we start the actual talk, then we go for the interview session, and finally, we go for the question answer round. Please put your questions, webinar-related questions, not the process and all. Everything is available in our website, or otherwise personally emailed to me. But uh, today we are collecting the questions from today's talk, your queries, your excitement, we can collect it and share to the speakers. And we try to answer a few que selected questions from today's webinar after that interview session. I request Shoma to start the webinar. And uh, Shubhu, will you be doing that, what we discussed earlier? Uh, okay. okay, please start. Hello everyone, welcome to another BioEngine webinar. BioEngine is a non-profit organization created to promote plant research worldwide. The webinar series has been designed to build a platform from where plant scientists can present their research to the world. We hope future scientists can gain perspective, inspiration and inspiration by listening to the esteemed plant researchers talk about their scientific accomplishments and their thoughts on the future of plant sciences. We are grateful that many renowned scientists have accepted our invitation to share their research insights with us. We are also thankful to you, the viewers of our BioEngine family, for your interest in BioEngine webinars, your constant support and appreciation. We have received a huge response through the registration for today's webinar. You can register for our webinars through our website, bioengine.com and through our social media pages. You can live view all our webinars or watch a recording later on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe so that you do not miss out on any of our live events. After attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation via the feedback link, which will be provided after the presentation. Please type in your questions related to today's talk in the YouTube chat box for the Q&A session. The topic for today's webinar is Potatoes 101, everything you need to know about it by our guest speaker, Dr. Samarindu Mohanty, Regional Director, Asia, International Potato Center or CIP, Hanoi, Vietnam. As Regional Director for the International Potato Center, CIP in Asia, Dr. Mohanty provides programmatic oversight for research and development portfolio, provides leadership in regional operational systems and plays representational role for CIP in the region with a focus on India, Bangladesh, 
Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. He, an American national, holds a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, a MSc in agricultural economics from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and a BSc from University of Agricultural Sciences in Bangalore, India. He joined the CIP after working as principal scientist at the International Rice Research Institute, or IRI, in the Philippines, and previously as head and senior economist for the Social Science Division in IRI since 2008. Previously, he also worked as Associate Professor and Associate Director for Cotton Economics Research Institute at Texas Tech University and Scientist at Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at Iowa State University. We are highly honored to have you with us today, Dr. Mohanty. The BioEngine platform is all yours now. Uh, thank you, Soma, and uh, thank you, Subo, both of you inviting me to the webinar series here. It's a pleasure to be here. And let me know if there is any problem in the sound and all. If the sound is okay, then I can proceed. Yes, yes sir. Good. Okay. Good. And thank you for the nice introduction you gave Soma on, on my profile there. As, uh, as Soma mentioned, uh, you know, I am an economist. I am not a biological scientist. But I've been working with biological scientists for the last 15, 20 years uh, with the CGI system. Let me share my screen, uh, then I can, we can start on the presentation there. Let, let me know when you see my slide. Uh, can you see my slide? Just yes, sir. Can? Okay. Great. Yes. Uh, let me take the head, head, headphone out, so uh, you can hear me, no? Perfect. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. No okay. issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you again, all of us, uh, all of you joining uh, this webinar here. I, I know there are, there are people registered from India, Pakistan, but Philippines, Bangladesh, and many other African countries, and also uh, US and Europe there. Uh, the topic, uh, the topic. I work on potato. There is definitely no doubt in that. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll start with some introduction about uh, my center where I work and the organizations I represent here. Then we talk about uh, what we do and the uh, significance of potatoes and how it improves the, these are the, this is what we are, I'm gonna cover who we are, we are as an institute, as myself, and uh, significance of potato, both in Asia and India. Uh, then we, I talk a lot on Indian potato sectors, but it has quite a relevance to what happens in the rest of uh, Asia and also in Africa there. So you can connect to the problems, the problems what Indian potato sector face is very similar to what happens all across the developing world there. Then I'll talk some of the, uh, you know, the, the, what potato does in terms of the food securities, climate resilience, uh, you know, crop there, uh, and, uh, and, and, and talk about how to improve the potato sector in terms of productivity, profitability of the farmer there. If you live in India, if you live in India, you must have heard low potato prices uh, last, just last month, uh, all over India, when the potato harvest uh, happened, the prices went down to two to three rupees per kg. Just can you imagine three rupees per kg of potato there? And uh, this is what happens for the perishable crop like potato all over the world. When the harvesting happens, the price drops and farmers lose money there. So I will talk about how to improve some of the supply chain there uh, and make it a more profitable crop for the farmers there. Uh, let me tell a uh, few background in terms of uh, what I, where I come from and where do I work. I work for CIP. It's called International Potato Center. Uh, it's, it's part of a CGIR group of institute where I think uh, I saw a lot of speakers from ERI have already uh, you know, spoken at this webinar there. So ERI is also, also part of a sister organization where I used to also work at ERI for nine years there. So we have, we have 15 organizations CGIR, but there is 11 centers now, one CGIR is under one management. And, but International Potato Center, International Rice Research Institute, CIMIT, International Food Policy Research Institute, International Livestock Research Institute, they are, they are all over the world, which represents this consultative group of international agricultural research. So we work uh, in different countries uh, and uh, our primary objective, I, as you can see, we work with the partners to achieve food securities, well-being of the farmers, gender equities for poor people, 
and particularly in the roots and tuber farming and food system in the developing world. So we have a mandate of working with the smallholders, millions of smallholders across, uh, across the continent, uh, both Asia, Africa, and the Latin America there. So our vision is to improve the lives of the poor. We are a non-profit organization. So we work for the poor most, most of the time. Uh, so if you know potato, sweet pot we also work on sweet potato. You know, that's a two mandate cup we, I have. I have these slides here because uh, we are the custodian. We have the global gene bank for both potato and sweet potato. And I know you consume potato. Many, you know, all, many participants here, you consume potato here. But do you know there are 4,000 plus varieties of potatoes in the world? We mostly consume Irish potato. Just look at the top left uh, photos there. These are the actual photos of potatoes. Different color, different shape, different size and different nutrition content there. You can see the, uh, the left top and top left hand side. Uh, so there are 4,000 plus edible varieties in our gene bank uh, right now. And we, our, our head office is in Lima, Peru. And Peru is considered the origin of potato. Okay. So that's the reason our head office is located in Lima and Peru. And we actually supply all these germplasms to the national partner uh, as on a request basis. Uh, for the breeding program. Many of these germplasm holds unique trait of climate resilience, drought tolerant, flood tolerant, you know, higher nutrition content, all these things. So we supply the germplasm to the national partner for developing new varieties there. And you know, potato is widely consumed. It's probably third and fourth important food security crop in the world after rice and wheat, probably maize or potato, the three and four, uh, you know, many different, depending on the different countries. More than 1 billion people worldwide consume potatoes there. So it's a, it's a widely consumed crop as a, many countries, a food security crop, many countries, a vegetable crops. So it, it has a different role to play there. So it's very highly, contrary to what people believe, potato is a bad crop, just like any other rice or sugar. Potato is very energy rich, very nutritious, and widely acceptable among the population there. So the, I think the, the it depends on how you consume potato. If you're boiling it, just like India and the subcontinent we consume, we put it in curry, we boil and we mass potatoes, we eat. It's very good. But the bad part comes when you fry it, make it French fries or chips. Those are probably the bad part with this is oil there. But if you consume potato right way, it's actually highly nutritious. And you know, 80% of potato is water. It's only 20%, less than 20% is dry matter there. So many times when the food crisis happens, uh, the grain cereal food crisis, like rice, wheat supply problem happens in the world, the potato works as a buffer crop. You know, remember this is also a staple for many countries. Uh, so it works as a buffer crop also when there is a crisis in the in the food in the cereal sector there. Then now coming to sweet potato, I will not talk about it, but I just I'm just telling we also have the la largest gene bank in the sweet potatoes. Sweet potato, if you live in India, you, you it's called it sucker can. You know, it's very highly nutritious. It's climate hardy crop. You hardly need any, you know, fertilizers, irrigation for this. And it can be grown in any poor soil there. So it's a very climate hardy crop. We used to consume all over the all over Asia, but a sweet potato consumption was very high. It has been declining over time there. We hardly we consume one kilogram per year right now. Uh, this is a crop uh, which has law, highly nutritious and should be consumed by, by all of us. But we have moved our way to more convenient crop like rice and wheat instead of uh, sweet potato, any of the other root crops there. Uh, International Potato Center, SIP, we developed this called orange flesh sweet potato. It's orange flesh there and high in vitamin A. Uh, so we got the world food price uh, for this orange flesh sweet potato, which is rich in vitamin A. It is now consumed by more than, it produced by more than 5 million farmers in Africa. Africa, this orange flesh sweet potato is a staple of food security, the nutrition security for many poor Africans there. So now we are trying to introduce in, in Asia, particularly India, Vietnam, Philippines, and Bangladesh, this orange flesh sweet potato and try to, because many locations, sweet potato are grown by the tribal population there. And for the tribal population, this is a, this is a highly cash crop, is a food security crop for them. So it's very important they grow this highly nutritious crop, which is literally organic crop. 
by default you don't need lot of uh, lot of inputs so you end up you know producing organic crop which is very climate resilient crop there so and it grows in very marginal conditions there very poor soil the sweet potato can be grown which, which is a beauty of that it is a cheap nutritious solution for the developing country there but unfortunately we are moving away from this all this nutritious crop like sweet potato millets you know this is the international year of millets you know so, so millets all this good crop we have been moving away to more convenient and fast food culture there you know we, you know we are not eating potato the way it should be but we are eating frozen french you know fried potatoes fried chips all this stuff there so we 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 work all over the, all over the developing world you can see uh, more than 18 19 countries we work primarily although our head office is in lima we operate primarily in asia and africa this is where most of the poverty lies and uh, we have a very strong presence in africa also because that's where the orange flavor sweet potato is uh, is uh, was developed and has been disseminated and been grown by the poor farmers for the poor food nutrition and and uh, gas security there let's come back come to potato there you know potato is not a not a native of asia you know it is normally if you look at the graph i have put there the the, the top green one you see this is the rest of the world potato consumption production there okay so if you go back to 60s potato use primarily was produced in europe you know it, if you look at uh, you know european countries they they normally account for more than 80 to 90% of the potato production in 50 60 years ago but that thing has changed now the 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 blue line you see that's the asian potato production there the blue line you see the, you can see over last 40 50 years it is slowly becoming an asian crop now we account asia the continent accounts for half of the global potato production as the european production has declined our production has increased so we actually so potato becoming a much more a, like a asian crop there and it used to grow it used to be grown in mostly temperate condition that's the reason it was not there in asia because we are more a tropical subtropical climate there but now the new varieties have been developed which can be grown in the subtropical climate there so that's the reason we see a lot of expansion in the potato uh, you know potato production in asia it's a, as i said it's a very uh, you know energy rich energy high energy crop and good for the poor it's a filler it's a filler crop for the poor people there uh within within uh, within asia if you if you look at who are all who, who, who which are the countries growing potatoes it's primarily if you look at china and india they account for the bulk of the potato production the red the red bar you see there that's the total ad, you know cumulative ad, you know total production of china and india they account for most of the potato production in asia there and potato is a staple for both both these countries both this uh, first and second largest most populous country there so just to give you some of the trends in the potato there we you know if you look at the the potato as the as the production has increased our utilization per capita level per person we we have we have been consuming lot more potato in the last 30 40 years than what we did in the past you can see until 90s it was like 10 kilograms but right now in the last 30 years it has tripled from 10 to 30 kilograms per person in india it's around 24 25 kilograms but if you look at within india there are quite a variation in the potato consumption eastern india consume lot more potato than the western or northwest or southern southern india there within asia nepal is one of the country where the potato per capita consumption is pretty much same as the european country the nepalis they consume 60 70 kilograms per head per year so they so 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 it's a huge significant food security crop for the poor people in the mahai mountain area in the nepal there uh, the indians indian eastern india consumption where we consume lot of potato is similar to bangladesh because you know the the culture the food habit in both eastern india and bangladesh very similar there so we eat lot more potato because it's a, i told you it's a filler any any as you if you are from eastern india or bangladesh if you eat any non veg food like mutton chicken fish you we put potato inside that because just think about this people didn't have the money so if you if you buy 1 kg of fish for a 
family of six or seven, you would like to put more potato so that you can eat with the gravy and potato there. You know, so a lot of people have been brought up in that situation, including myself. Now, when you give me a non-based food, like a mutton or chicken, I actually consume the gravy and potato first. There's more demand for potato than the meat itself because, because our food habit and all these things there. So within, within Asia, as I said, the wide variation in the potato consumption. In some, some, sec, some, uh, you know, some part of the Asia, the, they usually don't consume a lot of potato. You can see the red line is the Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam. The per capita, you see the per capita potato consumption is very, very low. So if you go to Southeast Asia, I'm pretty sure many of you have visited Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, you don't see a lot of potato dishes there. Usually now the potato is entering as a fast food, which is actually bad. The most of the Southeast Asian countries, they have started consuming, you know, French fries or chips from the McDonald's or what, what not, the first food there. So it's entering as a very non-healthy non or first food type of thing there. But if you look at the Eastern Asia and Southern Asia, where India and China are there, so they're the driver of the potato consumption. You can see Eastern Asia, the per capita consumption mostly led by China there, very high there. And same as in, in India, where these two are the drivers of potato consumption in these two regions, both Southern and Eastern Asia there. And it's going to continue in the future. If I, if I put one of the things to tell you, this is the Asian potato consumption over the years. So you see a strong trend, upward trend, which is going to continue. As we get richer, diversified food habit there, the, the people will start eating more fast food, processed potato food, uh, in the French fry, other things there. And the, the, the consumption is likely going to increase in the future there. And same in India, the trends in Asia and India is going to mirror image of each other. So you expect the potato consumption in both Asia and India and, and China, many countries, it's going to continue to rise in the future there. So the, so the question becomes, uh, uh, you know, how we consume potato there? Uh, they, so there's two, two, two regions there. One is developing Asia, one is developed Asia. Or which is developed Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So these are the countries, Singapore, these are the developed Asia, I see. So they have now adopted the food habit of more Western countries. So in those countries, the potato consumption, if you look at the... the, the uh, the left hand side, which is the Japanese uh, potato consumption there. So they, they don't consume a lot of table potatoes, a lot of processed potato, potato comes. Contrary to India, China and developing country, we consume a lot of table potatoes, you know, home consumptions, you know, all these things there. But we are slowly moving into consuming a lot more processed potato, which is not good. Actually, the, the table consumption, eating at home in, in curry, you know, or in a mass potato is much better than what the developed country or developed Asia is consuming now. Uh, just to tell the potato is uh, not traded, you know, there is no big trade of potato between country because it's logistical issue there. You know, it rots within 10, 15 days. And uh, so, so the, you see very little amount of potato is traded. So most of the potato grown in the country is consumed by the country there. So all, so there's only 3 million tons of potato, fresh potato is traded. So there is not much trading of fresh potato happening, uh, you know, in Asia or in other parts of the world there. But what is happening right now is the trading of the frozen potatoes, frozen French fries, and the, for the chips there. You can see the increase in imports by Asian countries. As I as I told you, many of the Southeast Asia, East Asian countries, they consume, they are starting to consume more and more French fries, uh, chips. And they import those things from the Western country, particularly Europe and US there. So you can see the, see the upward trend in terms of the Asian imports of the frozen potato, which is, which is going to continue to rise as, the, as we diversify our food habit and, and become richer and more disposable item, disposable income there, and we consume a lot more faster food. We demand a lot more French fries and chips. We continue to import from the other countries there. Let me skip some of the things there here. So these are the, some of the, the importers there. And as you know, as I told you, the frozen French fry, they mostly exported by US and the Europe there. Also all Japan, South Korea, they do, they import from the US and Western Europe. 
to to consume the as a as a frozen threads right there uh, but i just come back to india india is very different from other asian country india has emerged as only asian country as a net exporter of frozen french fries so we have actually turned around that thing we started importing french fries in early 2000s but now we have become a growing exporter of frozen french fries to mostly the neighboring countries uh, you know southeast asia middle east and africa okay so we have started competing with the with the western markets particularly the us and western europe into the uh, into their export their their market in asia there and becoming larger and larger exporter of frozen potato which is very good news uh, in terms of uh, development in india as a net exporter of uh, potato there as you know in the last uh, 40 years uh, significant growth in the in the in the in our production has come from the uh, from the from the eel because the acres there is not much area to bring into the production there so lot majority of the growth has happened uh, because of eel and the intensification of the existing physical area there that's true for potato and true for any other crops there so if you if you if i just sum it up in terms of what has happened so in in asia particularly and true for africa so table potato accounts for major share of the total consumption in developing asia only 5 to 10% are the processed potato there but that but this this the trend of the processed potato is continuing to increase over the time there so they complement the relationship between potato and rice everybody say they are substitute but i look at in asia there are complements potato and rice they kind of go together instead of consuming one or the other there and potato also is not a substitute for many other vegetables there so the also no significant substitution between table and the processed potato in consumption there there are two different complete market there so the table potato consumption is expected to rise in the future due to income growth at the same time the consumption of, of the processed potato is also expected to grow at a much higher rate maybe double digits in the future there so the question becomes since we want to consume lot of this potato now how to expand the production there this is what the challenge is to the to asia and africa and many other continent ki how to expand production when we don't have the land there with us we don't have physical land to bring into production and how to expand production to meet this growing demand for both table and the processing potato there coming slowly on the on the on the indian subcontinent here so you see the 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 green dots you see where this is that's where the potatoes acres or potato is cultivated in in both india bangladesh and nepal and pakistan there so you can see the the belt is all across kind of covers the entire indo gangetic plain there in the, so it's it's grown in the on the banks of the indo gangetic plain where the soil is little sandy the irrigation is available that's where it is it is grown uh, in the uh, in in asia particularly in south asia there so if you look at the how where the potato stands in the crop calendar the cropping system so predominantly right now in india it's a winter crop india bangladesh nepal pakistan it's a primarily predominantly winter crop in also southeast asia it is a, it is a winter crop there so the crop calendar normally we plant in november december majority of the crop and harvest in march or april there so we just had the harvest recently you know couple of months last month actually so they mostly in 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 asia all over you know including india uh, and other southeast asian countries it is planted after the paddy harvest there so we harvest the paddy and the plant potato you know in the belt there so some in india particularly the early planting happen in northwest india particularly punjab haryana western uttar pradesh himachal pradesh late planting happen in eastern india where the paddy harvesting takes place late Uh, in november december then they plant potato there so if you look at the the, the way the potato is a sandwich crop between rice and maize in many parts or rice and vegetable in many parts so if you look at the farmers in haryana and northwest india they harvest rice then they have the option of growing potato or wheat so potato competes with the wheat land there so they grow either potato or the wheat there then they go for the vegetable crops or the or the maize crop there you know so so the, at least the three three cropping three crop cropping systems is in place where potato works as a sandwich crop in many parts of the parts of asia there it's compete with with wheat in the northwest india particularly 
where the cooler climate there and the suitable for the wheat cloth, wheat cultivation there. For many other parts of uh, India, Bangladesh, it actually competes with other crops, uh, vegetable crops, other crops there. So if you look at, uh, you know, I have I don't have this data for uh, for all all country in terms of varietal contribution. Let me just focus on India, which is the, the 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 story is very similar in other countries there. In particular, in India between between 1950 and 2020, which is around uh, 70 years, 65 new varieties have been developed, released to the Indian Council of Agriculture, which is Central Potato Research Institute. Uh, most of them are table potatoes. Remember. In Asia, we consume primarily table potato. The, so the government organizations, they mostly focus on the table potatoes there. Only seven to eight processing variety and the rest of them table. So right now, India has 2.25 million hectares under potatoes there. And 95% of area now under this variety is released in the last 50 years by Central Potato Research Institute there. And if you look at the, the, the potato acres, India used to be a very minor potato producers in 50s, less than half a million hectares. Right now, it has increased by more, more than eightfold to 2.25 million hectares there. And the yield has increased from 7 to 24 tons per hectare in 2020. And production has increased, just look at the trend, 2.7 million tons to more than 53 million tons in 2023 there. So significant growth in the potato production, both by area and the yield there. Area means it is, remember, it's a sandwich crop between, between, uh, between rice and some other crops there. So many fallow land has come into potato production in the last 50 years there, which used to be just fallow after the paddy harvest. So if you look at India, the major potato varieties, uh, you, know, you know, so are Kufri, some of the varieties I have mentioned, Kufri Jyoti, Kufri Bahar, Kufri Chandamukhi, these are the major varieties grown in the major growing state like Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar, Gujarat, and Karnataka. But what I would like to mention here is that just look at the age of these varieties there. I think this is true for all crop in all countries. You know, so just look at the Kufri Pokhara. This is the only variety which was released in the last 30 years. Other the, the two other popular, three other popular varieties, they are Jyotis, Bahar, and Chandramukhi. They were they actually released in more than 50 years ago, nearly 55 years ago. So farmers still they dominate the, the acres now in India, the older variety. The average age of a potato variety in India is more than 30 years. So, so you know, out of the 65 varieties India has devel developed or released, nearly 30 of them were released after 2000. But none of them are mega varieties. So last 20 years. So none of the varieties released by CPI are the mega variety like Jyoti and replaced Jyoti, Bahar, or Chandramukhi there. And it is true for all crop. You know, if you look at the rice, but you know, wheat or anything, the average age of varieties, uh, you know, in the with the farmers, is more than 25, 30 years there. Uh, so most of the older varieties still dominate uh, the, the the production domain there. Some of the processing variety, Kufri, Chipsona, one has taken a lot of uh, acres, Kufri fry zone has There's a lot of good processing varieties. Also, India has developed. That's the reason India has emerged as a net exporter of frozen French fry because of the development of these uh, processing varieties, uh, you know, in India there. So, so if you look at, uh, in, in terms of what farmers want, how, do, how does this varietal turnover takes place? Why farmers not accepting the new variety? Why the farmers are still growing? The older variety is there. So, so the, the key question becomes, you know, do we do we have do we exactly know what farmer wants? Do the far the, do this variety release that available to the farmer, the seed one, and how quickly the seed system delivers this new varieties there? So these are the some of the and the smallholder conundrum is that the smallholder they diseconomy of scale because of small size and mechanizations, they're reluctant to adopt a new variety there or buy seeds from the market there. So very, very various regions why farmers are still growing the older varieties there. So the, the problem with the seed system, their problem with the uh, you know availability of the new variety to the small farmers, all these factors add up to having problem in terms of not new variety not getting adopted by the farmers there. So what farmers are looking for, in, not only in India, all over all, all over uh, all across Asia and Africa, 
that uh, with, you know they are not growing potato only doing the backward cultivation now before they used to just grow potato for their own family consumption now they are going for the market so we need to make sure the they are looking they are most looking for the the potato they cultivate whether they are marketable or not so the shape and size of the tubers and storability of the tubers very important for the farmers because they will be stays to selling it uh, selling it in the market there and the second most important it should fit their cropping system if they have they they they, they harvest the paddy crop and they would like to have another crop of potato there so your potato crop the duration should fit the crop calendar there if you introduce a potato crop which is high yielding but takes 130 140 days it will not be adopted by the farmers because they don't have that window there they have actually lot less window 70 80 90 days now so any short duration variety 78 early maturing varieties are well accepted by the farmers because they can harvest potato quicker and take up another crop there which is good so many of the focus of both sip and uh, national partners like cpri on bari in bangladesh or nark in nepal is to develop early maturing short duration varieties there so which feeds the crop calendar in asia the crop intensification is very high the the farmers grow three to crops three to four crops a year so you cannot have a long duration crop in asian farming system unlike uh, western europe europe or, or america where potato is wherever the in europe or america the potato is cultivated it is a single crop a year that's the only thing farmers do so this so you can introduce a 140 days crop with high yielding that's perfectly acceptable for the farmers because they want more longer duration more yield because that's the only crop they have but that is not true in in asian context african context particularly asian context where where the where the crop in intensity is very high there farmers many location vietnam india um, bangladesh three crop is the minimum now the farmers have been inching towards the four crops there i have some uh, farmers friends in in haryana they are trying to introduce see whether they can fit one more crop having 70 days potato crop early planting of potato early planting of uh, sorry early planting of rice then early harvest plant the potato early short duration harvest is in december then introduce a vegetable crop then go for maize there so 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 there four crops a year many farmers are now planting to to shift the crop calendar there so the in in asian context the duration of the potato crop or any crop actually very important any crop which is short duration is well accepted at the farmers there you cannot have there is no scope for having a long duration crop and early maturing if it's maturing early you can sell it in the market in potato particularly if you can harvest your crop two weeks earlier than the than the major crop comes in you can get 30 20 30 percent price higher there so there is there is a huge incentive for the farmers to harvest early before the the main harvest comes to the market and so that they can get the higher price for the crop because if the there is a glut in the market the price drops then the farmers in the trouble there so early maturing and short duration very important potato when the breeders are developing a new variety there and now we are facing with lot of stresses both biotic and abiotic stresses there particularly potato lot of pest and diseases there a late blight what wilt in so many different things so many area there so you know uh, so so many many farmers late blight is one of the diseases could be very devastating farmers lose complete crop there if the, if the proper uh, precautions measures not taken there so any variety which is late blight resistant is 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 in high demand for the farmers there you know in terms of the you know adopting a particular variety there and particularly the other one is the heat and drought tolerant remember this is a winter crop many many location is you know they don't have the irrigation facility there so anything which is heat tolerant or drought tolerant is well accepted you know also if there is heat tolerant variety there the farmers can plant early in september october they can plant if the if the if the variety is heat tolerant and harvest early and go for the next crop there so farmers looks into their cropping system lot more complex way than 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 somebody sitting outside there farmers take into lot of different things to decide which which variety to adopt either rice or wheat or, or vegetable or maize there so it's very important that the when the breeders developing the variety 
they, they factor all these things into that. And on location, which variety should be targeted where? You cannot just blindly uh, you know, release the variety in all locations. You need to see where your variety fits the most and you target that particular regions uh, for more adoption there. Then the skin color of the potato is very important. White versus red. In many parts, red skin is preferred, like particular Eastern India, Bangladesh. And you know, in many parts, uh, you know, other parts like Nepal, uh, Northwest India, or uh, in Pakistan, it's white skin is much more preferred there. So the skin color also matters in some parts of the thing there. So this is three varieties recently, which has been in, released in India. And these are the same variety also have been released in Bangladesh. I think the red skin one has been released in Bhutan there. So these, these are the three varieties, ship lines. Uh, the Kufri Lima is one of the drought tolerant uh, heat and virus resistance there. Kufri third two, they both are white skin there. They are also drought tolerant water efficient crop. The third one is called Kufri Uday. It has been released in India, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. You know, so so it, the the Bhutan it has been released few years ago. Bangladesh also it was released few years ago. So it's a red skin biofortified potato there. It's highly resistant to a lot of virus there. What we have witnessed now in the last couple of years is that the, the farmers really love these particular red skin varieties. Even in Haryana, Punjab, and Northwest India, because of the its high yielding and also the uh, virus resistance there. So the, the, this particular variety has a, has a uh, uh, you can see the, the, the skin color, which is very baby pink type of thing, and the and the and the flesh is kind of yellow is white, which is well preferred by the consumers there. So I, I really believe that this particular variety has a potential to a next mega variety, particularly in the subcontinent. India, Bhutan, uh, Pakistan, sorry, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan there. Huge potential there because of this resistance to the viruses, high yielding, high in vitamin A, and looks beautiful in terms of the color of the skin there. Um, so if you look at the varietal turnover in terms of farmers, one of the one of the biggest constraint uh, in 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 potato is that the time it takes to to release a variety there. Sometimes, suppose ship the our scientist in Lima or somewhere else develop a varieties, it takes more than twenty years for the variety to come to the country, get the trial, other things, get it released. Once it is released. It takes another five to 10 years for the seed to be available there. So we're looking at 20 years time horizon. When the variety will be released, the variety will be kind of useless. The trait it has, the, the purpose it serves, maybe it is not needed anymore. You know, so, so it's very important that we speed up the variety release process there. All over, all across Asia and Africa there, instead of taking the 20 years, make sure it is released much more quicker way. You know, so I, here I have, I have done the calculations. It takes 27 years or more for new variety to these farmers. 27 years is a long, long, long time for the variety to lose its value. Actually, if it was if it was developed for some particular biotic abiotic resistance, there 20, 27 years down the road, that that stresses may not be there. So the, that variety has no value in terms of getting it released to the farmers there. Um, let me, let me talk another big constraint in the potato is the seed system. You know, potato is a crop where uh, seed is the biggest input in terms of the cost of production. Uh, the farmers are nearly spend 50% of the total cost is on seed. If you have one hectare of land, if you have one hectare of land and you need around 2.5 to 3 tons, 3,000 kg, 2,500 to 3,000 kg of potatoes, if you buy good quality seed, the seed cost, depending on where you are, where seed, you know, particularly India, seed is produced in all in Punjab and transported to the rest of the India there. And as you go to the east and south, the seed price increases. So if, you, for example, Eastern India, if I talk about it, seed price of one hectare of potato could be more than 100,000 rupees, which is, which is around 1,200 to 1,300 USD, US dollar. Just think about a small holder, one hectare of land holding, wants to grow potato. And if he spends $1,200 per seed alone, 
and he there is no guarantee what price he is going to get if, the, if this is a major bumper crop year the price of potato goes down after the harvest then he is bound to lose money when when he spent so much money on the seed there okay so that's a big problem in the potatoes so most of the farmers in the subcontinent in in southeast asia or africa they actually do not use quality seed they actually go to the market local market where the table potatoes uh, mandis there market there they actually get the discarded one which the, which is not you good for human consumption they just bring those discarded small tubers there and use it as a seed there when that happens then the the seed is the foundation of everything if you have good quality seed you get higher yield good quality of tubers there if you have bad quality seed you get lower yield and the bad quality of tubers there this is exactly what happens to the with the potato small holders there they really do not cannot afford to spend that much money and the, even if somebody has money they they really don't have the uh, they, they you know they are concerned about the risk market risk you know whether they will get the money back at the end of the season because the price of the potato might drop uh, so so that's so high price high, high price fluctuations so make it very difficult for farmers to take that risk there so unlike uh, rice and wheat it that's a big problem rice and wheat you can you can sell it to the government at minimum support price in many countries including india or the philippines bangladesh and uh, also you can keep it for a while if the price is low you can afford you can keep it for a while that is not in the case of potato you cannot keep for a long time if you decide to put in the cold storage the price is fixed price for the whole nine months doesn't matter you keep it for five days 10 days two months three months five months five months six months up to eight nine months you have to pay 2 rupees per kg you know in india i'm talking i'm pretty sure it's very similar to other countries there that's a huge amount additional burden for the farmers you grow the potato then you put in the cold storage and spend another 2 uh, rupees per kg there and there's no guarantee you'll get that money back and and they also many farmers need money after the harvest to pay for the expenses or to pay for the household expenses and the money they have borrowed for For, for for farming there so that's another issue in terms of seed there uh, so, so 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 for the for the small holders there million of small holders uh, um, so, so you know potato actually they grow potato in 0.03 acre very small land holding back at them for them getting seed quality seed is a big issue because if you want to order seed you have to order one truck load of seed from from a certified seed producer and that's a 25 tons of seed that 25 acres you need so so they really don't have that uh, capacity to to order seed also that's also another issue in terms of thing there so let me talk about the seed system this is one of the things uh, we have introduced in india and this particular technology called apical rooted cutting this is a very low cost seed production if you have if you uh, go to my linkedin side or anywhere i post quite a bit on this apical rooted cutting so when i was based in vietnam we i saw this particular typical rooted cuttings in the lat area high high uh, highlands of vietnam where potato is cultivated and this low cost they actually grow cultivate the multiply the seed produce the seed using this typical rooted cuttings there if you look at uh, the normal potato seed supply chain okay it is aeroponics is kind of a well well documented where both india china vietnam philippines you you name it even bangladesh the aeroponics is the is the standard method of producing seed you produce this tissue culture plantlet you take it to this aeroponic facility you see on the top left there and you spray the new very high take temperature control then you lift the you lift the shaft there and harvest your crop every 15 20 days there then the produce you get is in the top right corner that's the mini tubers they got it it's actually produced completely virus free completely um, you know clean environment or any sort of uh, infection not there but the cost is very high uh, in terms of the production so when you give this if this become your starting material if this was starting material and you, you sell it to the farmers to seed multiplication they have to multiply several rounds to bring the cost down there because of the cost of this mini tubers there so we introduce alternate one which was been which has been practiced in vietnam for decades actually 
Vietnam, China, and sheep also has been disseminating in Africa called apical looted cutting. You, your starting material is still the same. It's a tissue culture plantlet. You Instead of going to the other ponies, you bring the tissue culture plantlet to the poly house. So you set up the mother bed there, okay, the, the in the poly house. And then you can do the apical cutting every 15, 20 days there. So your mother, sub-mother, sub-sub-mother, you can, you can do it for two, three months to bring the cost down. Then the seedling you can plant, either in net house or in the open field. Many locations, if there is a feed pressure is low, you can plant in the open field by the small holders there. Then you produce a equivalent mini tubers, which you see in the top. The cost is a fraction of what it used, you would have costed in the aeroponics there. Then you have that stacking material, you have to, you can multiply one or two rounds and, uh, and, uh, and sell it in the market much cheaper. So if this particular technology has the potential to bring the seed cost by more than 50%, and more importantly, more importantly, the seed production, which is concentrated now, could be decentralized, could get out from the, from the big companies to the smallholders. That's the beauty of it. The smallholders in, 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 in Odisha, Assam, or Bihar, they can buy a few thousand cutting or seedling and produce these mini tubers in the open field and multiply and keep the seed for themselves. And they, so they are not exposed to the market for seed. So they have a quality seed they have produced for their own requirement and selling to the farmers. So this particular technology has the potential to decentralize the seed system in from, from few companies to thousands and thousands of smallholders, FPOs, they can produce seed for their farmers and, and and sell it to their farmers at a much lower rate and the quality also guaranteed there compared to right now, there's no guarantee on the quality. The potato seeds sold in the market is called truthfully labeled. So there is not a certified, it's truthfully labeled. They're labeling it based on some truthfulness there. So this is, this is some of the example I'm giving you in Odisha, the, the, you see on the top one, that's the apical looted cutting. They're, they're planted on wheat mat very low cost wheat mat on the cocoa pit to make it virus free. So the, so the, so the, so the, the starting material generation zero seeds you produce, it's virus free. It is not touching the soil. If you don't touch soil, there is no virus there in the there. Then you can multiply those in the open field there. So the Bhubaneswar, which is not a major potato producer and the most of the farmers in Odisha, in the Eastern part of India, most of the farmers who are actually very poor, they cannot afford to buy seed from Punjab. They actually can produce their own seed, become self-sufficient, the seed requirement there. The same photo you see. Uh, what I want to see, the, the low-cost design we have developed in the creating this box structure with the wheat mat, with the bamboo stick there, and put the cocoa pit. And this cocoa pit and wheat mat can be reused for a few years there. So it is not that one year it's wasted. Next year also you can plant on the same thing there. So this is in Assam. You can see these apical looted cuttings. Uh, what I want, I'm showing here is that I'm taking that seed production system from the private companies to the smallholders there. So the smallholders can produce their own seed there. That's the whole idea is that. So here some farmers have planted it in net house. Some farmers have planted in the open field there so that they can become more, they can become self-sufficient. And this is what you see is a nurseries in Karnataka, in Hassan, Karnataka there. So the, so the many vegetable nurseries, they have now converted growing this epic potato seedling there. So, so they take buy those, uh, buy those bottles from the tissue culture lab, these plantlets of new varieties there. Then they set up the mother bed. They, they do this cutting for four or five months and sell these cuttings to the farmers at a very cheap rate there. Smallholders can take these cuttings and produce seed, uh, multiply for himself or herself and also sell it to other farmers in the village there. So in last season alone, there are more than 5 million cuttings were produced by these private nurseries. So it's very attractive for the youth, for the young who wants to enter the agriculture, enter into this particular epical looted cutting supply chain there. There's a lot of scope in terms of, uh, you know, uh, making money also, first of all. But second, also, you are also making changes in people's life in, in the thing there. So this is example again in the Karnataka, Haryana, I can skip some of this thing in Odisha. So this is another thing what I would like to focus is UC map Kufri Karan, Kufri Uday, I told you the red skin one. 
so the, this epical the dated cutting what it does is is actually brings the new varieties where i told it takes many many years for the seed to come to the market the, it can come to the farmers in the next year in epical dated cutting our farmers in meghalaya now have the seeds of this kufri uday or uc map which is a very new varieties to epical dated cutting the traditional supply chain there is no rooted epical rooted sorry uc map in the supply chain because they really don't know the demand so they don't have they don't produce seed of this particular new variety they will wait until there is demand is there then they will produce it that probably 5 10 years down the road but epical rooted cutting allows the small holders to have the seeds of these new varieties so the small holders in odisha meghalaya assam you know other locations they have actually access to the seeds of these new varieties there which is the beauty of this particular technology in terms of decentralizing it making the Uh, seeds of the new variety available to the farmers there then we also you know having some sort of assurance to the to the farmers in terms of quality seed they are buying remember they sell truthfully label seed so this is a branding and certification we are experimenting piloting with haryana farmers so the logo you see on the top red color har alu if you if the if the, if the company or the farmers want to go, sell seed and uh, you know uh, and you know follow the steps and laid down by by the government there with, with our help there they can get to use the logo on their bag just like if you if you know you know homali rice jasmine rice if you know the you know in thailand is a is a major thailand and cambodia vietnam they produce jasmine rice but in 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 particular in thailand they they have a homali logo the green logo there if the farmers produce the you know follow the steps they they get to use that logo in the bag there if you are if you are consumers and you see that logo you can uh, you can assure that this is done in the proper way the quality is good then you can buy it. so we are doing the similar thing in haryana's potato seed there where the farmers can can be assured they are getting a quality seed when they see the logo there so this is the har al you know this is called har alu haryana alu this is the step in their certification process if somebody wants to get the logo they have to follow the steps they have it has to, they have to be monitored and in the end they get a logo they can use you can see there is a logo on the on the bottom called har alu logo there so another things i would like to focus very quickly i think uh, i think it's close to one hour i'll i'll stop it very soon there when when you talk about the potato farmers there you you know that they are very small there if if your average land holding is 1 hectare average land holding potato farmers is probably fraction of a acre they don't grow the entire land potato they grow only small area of the land there so when they when you are small you really have a diseconomy of scale you have no bargaining power not only potato it true for all crops if you are small holders you cannot mechanize it because if you have a you know one one fourth of acre or one acre there you cannot buy a tractor you cannot buy a planter you cannot buy a digger you cannot buy a harvester it doesn't make sense there is no economy of scale if you buy it you, you will not get your money back if you have a small piece of land there so you cannot mechanize it unless you go to a service provider and and you you know use the use the machine from the service provider to do it there so what we also do in potato farming in many parts it, this is also another another practice that was started in vietnam then we introduced in india in a slightly different way there we call small you know small farmer large field it's a collective action model we bring the farmers together we bring the farmers together to achieve that scale and the bargaining power if the things they would they would not have been able to do individually by coming together they can do it you know for example the, you know setting up a Uh, group nursery for for paddy if you look at the paddy everybody has a nursery on the corner of the field there they have the individual nursery there is is expensive time consuming you know you cannot mechanize it but if if you bring 30 40 farmers together you can have one patch of big nursery depending on the requirement you buy your own seed but you have it in one place to achieve that scale effect it reduces the cost it reduces the time taken by the farmers they have lot more free time to do similarly potato Biggest quantity is the seed. I told you you require to purchase twenty-five ton minimum, and you have no bargaining power. You you cannot bargain there. But if the farmers come together, two hundred farmers come together, 
they put uh, they require as uh, you know potato seed of 200 tons and they can actually bargain with the companies that we need eight trucks of potatoes uh, you know 200 tons of potato and this is the price we'll give and this is the quality we require and this is the time you need to deliver us and because of your size the 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 seed producers, the seed company will listen to you. They will negotiate you. But you have to have the bargaining power there. You have to come together. There's a collective action model we do in terms of bringing the farmers together so they get the discount, you know, negotiated the seed, quality seed there. Then they get the, you know, they can actually rent the, go to the service provider saying that we would like to rent the planter for the entire 50 acres. And the, the, the cost will go down by 20, 30, 40 percent there. For the service board, if they know that entire 50 acres, he has that thing there, so he can plan properly and reduce the cost there. So when you harvest it, so you have a good quality of tubers from good quality seed there, you have a buyers at your doorstep. So you basically bring the market to your doorstep. Instead of you going to the market, market comes to you. So that's the beauty of you know, the volume of production you have there. Either we have tried with uh, rice. We are now doing with potato there. We'll be doing sweet potato there. So if you come together and do it as collective action there, you take advantage of the negos, you know, uh, negos, you know, you have the bargaining power in the input market, output market, your cost goes down, your time taken goes down. So, you know, uh, so a lot of advantage of doing that as long as the, they, the farmers can stay together longer time because the politics is other thing Sometimes they break, go apart, but the benefits of doing together is the only way for the smallholders to come together. It, so it's a kind of informal FPOs type of thing. They come together, they buy seed together, they do their own thing, they, they come together, sell their produce there. So whenever there are benefits, they come together to achieve that scale effect at bargaining power there. So you see, this is a picture from, I think, Assam. You know, uh, So we have this uh, 200 to 300 farmers there uh, around 200 acres there. So you see the, see the, it looks like it's some part of Western Europe there. Uh, the, this group farmers, this 200, 300 farmers, they did the seed purchase. They, they connected to the uh, chips producing come PepsiCo, Haldiram. So the, so the chip, PepsiCo, Haldiram, they come to their farm, to their village to pick up the tubers there. So really, they really did, do not need to worry about it. They've actually beat up the price there. When they see the quality uh, tubers there, suitable for chips production there, they come to the village and give premium price and buy it from these 300 farmers we created. It's called Jinjia village in Assam there. So we also create a lot of this model where one in one village, potato village, 300, 200, 300 farmers, there are 500 acres there. So we make some seed producers producing quality seed using this low cost technology, make some farmers, uh, service providers. So one farmer, they have everything there for potato, you know, so they grow good quality potato, then the buyers come and buy it from them there. So we also do a lot of varietal introduction demonstration so that uh, they link to the, they adopt good varieties, link to the processing industries there. So we're replicating this type of model for the smallholders particularly. To, to overcome their, their, their constraints they face as a smallholders there. So, so let me let me conclude there. It's already close to one hour there. So you know the, in concluding as we have we already have eight billion more than eight billion people. India is the most populous country, so we will be reaching reaching to 10 billion in next three decades there, eight to 10 billion there. On top of the, on top, on top of the population, we have several emerging challenges. The most important, you know, is the climate changes. All this ex more frequent occurrence of the extreme weather, more, you know, untimely flood, untimely drought, more flood, more drought. So more, you know, you, you will see more of this as we go in the future there. Then our soil health is a big issue. Many locations, soil health has been affected by last 50 years of intensive cultivation there. Groundwater depletion in many locations there. It's a huge, huge problem in many parts of Asia. Then we have the straw burning issue in many parts of Asia. If you, I don't have the thing, but you see in October, November, the entire Asia kind of leads up with red light because the straw burning takes place with the satellite image there. And several other challenges coming in terms of the agriculture there, the, the young the youth 
they are not interested to go to agriculture. It's not a very attractive profession. And if you have one hectare of land, you really cannot make a living out of the one hectare of land, one hectare of land there. You, you would rather be better off going and doing as a, doing some odd job in the city rather than staying in the agriculture there. So that's a you know big problem in terms of keeping the youth in the agriculture there. So you see a lot of migration happening. Uh, the, you know, the, the many if you go to the many cities in India or in Bangladesh or in Philippines, you will see the rural people, you know, rural youth working as a waiter, as a odd daily laborer there. Although they have uh, decent land holding back home, many people have three, four hectares of land there, but they really don't. Uh, first of all, it's hard work; it doesn't pay off, pay well in terms of the return they get. Uh, so it it's not very attractive for the youth to come back to farming at this point. You know, you do you see a lot of migration happening. So we need to stop that by making agriculture attractive profession there, which is true. When you when you go back to COVID. Every every sector shut down except the agriculture. The agriculture will never shut down. Nobody will because we always need food there. So the so it's it's a sector which is huge importance and uh, and a lot of opportunities. If you go ahead, if you look ahead in terms of the in next 5, 10, 20 years, there's so many things uh, can happen in agriculture, Dig digitalizations, artificial intelligence, you know, all these things have in the pipeline which will make agriculture very attractive profession. Mechanization happening, so everything automized, and uh, you know, micro educations, all these things happening, could make agriculture highly profitable uh, in the future. There. So let me stop here. I, I already took one hour ten minutes. Uh, then we can we we can uh, we can take some questions and uh, answer other questions there. So I'll I, with that I will stop sharing my slides. Thank you, sir. It's a it's a very interesting, and uh, we love to hear our uh, angle from an economist scientist also because uh, that that is the questions. Uh, many many times in our uh, previous webinars, we are uh, actual we are not ever actual the field situations as you give us the uh, idea that uh, more than 30 years, more than 50 years, no variety are predominantly accepted by the farmers. So it is the uh, very good message for us that uh, need more work. Uh, there is an opportunity of working uh, researchers, uh, breeders uh, seriously for that particular crop. And uh, um, you have uh, introduced few other concepts, which uh, I think I don't have like a uh, uh, few questions like the Haralu concepts is a good concept. So we are in discussions, we are uh, going for more details about that concept that how it's formed, how it's regulated, is it NGO, is it supported by the government. And uh, many uh, speakers are asking about the role of CIP in their own countries from Pakistan, few people asking that uh, how they are in, in, in mountain areas uh, in North Pakistan, is there any opportunity or involvement of CIP for the productions uh, of such crops? And uh, I have collected few questions that they are asking that hydroponic systems is uh, uh, how, how uh, it uh, uh, economically and reliable means uh, can anybody uh, start a hydroponic potato system and it can be profitable. And I have also found a questions that uh, uh, asking for the storage related problem because uh, there is uh, government regulation is very low means uh, most of the private sector are dealing that facility and not regulated by properly by the government. So the price of storing is a little bit difficult and not controllable. So uh, most of the these type of questions I have uh, received and it's going to be more and more. I asked all the participants, please put your questions related to that. So sir, first we go for the your interview, then uh, we come into that. I put that questions in my, your mind because yeah. during the interview, we can also put if you wanted to answer this. Shoma, please go for the interview session. We will continue with the interview session and all the viewers, please put in your questions. Okay.
so uh, let's begin this uh, this section is very um, interesting and uh, um, you know, uh, loved by many viewers because uh, through this interview session, we get to know more about the speaker and their views on different uh, things other than the uh, presentation that they gave. So um, uh, let's start this session, sir. Uh, so uh, uh, what do you uh, find most interesting about uh, working with potato crops? Yes, the the... You know, I have worked in several crops in my career here. I started with wheat. I spent first 15 years in the US, then last 15 years in Asia. I used to work for wheat, then I moved to corn and soybeans, then cotton, then rice, then potato and sweet potato there. Among all these crops are the unique in terms of the niche there, why they're important there. You know, rice is consumed by half of the world global populations. It's a it's a food for the poor and very sensitive political crop there. And potato has its own, own story in terms of why I love it. The, the, if you look at the potato sector there, it is now it's a very become a very important crop. As, as I said, it's a sandwich crop between the rice and the other crop, you know, or the maize or the vegetables there. But potato is very important cash crop for the farmers. So if you are trying to improve livelihood of the smallholders. If, if, if we can bring down the seed cost lower, instead of $200 or 100,000 rupees per hectare, if I can bring down the cost to half or less than half, which we are trying to do with this low cost technology, the seed cost comes down. And many location farmers can make more than 100,000 rupees per hectare profit if it is done right. Okay, So it could be very important cash crop for farmers to improve the livelihood. That's the reason I think, uh, you know, I love this crop because it has the huge potential, which needs to be, ex you know, exploited now, developing the seed system, storage, storage thing there, and even having a futures market for potato, where the, where, the, where, the, where the farmer can hedge their price risk there. It's a highly risky crop for the farmer. So a lot of things needs to be done. That's the reason I'm interested. Because I think a lot of things can be done to improve this particular sector. Sir, uh, as you mentioned that you have worked on many crops, uh, so you have a lot of experience in that. And uh, I have this uh, question, like you have changed from one crop to the other. So how did you uh, get where you are? I mean, you started off with your uh, bachelor's, master's and PhD. And then how did you, uh, you know, build yourself up to the, reach this position? Yes. Our viewers yeah. would be very interested to hear that, I'm yes. sure. Yes. I am, I am an agriculture economist by training, but I have a BSc in agricultural marketing where I took a lot of agriculture field course there. You know, uh, then, then I went to US to do my master's and PhD and became a faculty professor there in the university doing research. But my life was very different there because they, there you don't talk to, you don't go to the field. Mm -hmm. Everything is done. You know, there is no access to human to human access is, is very restrictive. You cannot go survey somebody. You have to follow a lot of restrictions there. Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing, working with the secondary data, working with the bigger farmers, you know, the size of the farmers bigger, working as a policy advocacy. I became a policy analyst there. Okay. You know, after a certain time, you think you need to do change your area. So when I came to Asia, that's one of the reasons to work directly with the smallholders. I wanted to make difference in people's life, you know, millions of the smallholders there where you can do it working in Asia, working in ERI or SIP type of organization. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I ended up shifting from one cup to another. As an economist, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. If I'm a biological scientist, I'm a breeder, mm -hmm. I may have some constraint. I think they still, I've, I've seen breeders have shifted from mm -hmm. crop to crop yes. there. But for this economist, it's very easy actually. For me, a lot easier. And we are not into more into technical side. We are into, you know, using the data, using the tools to answer the questions there. And uh, so it was easier for me to shift from crop to crop. And you learn quite a bit. When you work on different crop, you know the systems approach. Okay. You know, I'm not, con con I know, if you ask me in the, in the only potato, but I can tell you all the other crop, they're in the system. They work in the Compare crop. also, yeah. Correct, correct. Uh, so, sir, um, my next question is uh, about GM crops. Uh, what is your opinion on GM crops? And do you think they have a future in attaining food security? 
Uh, yes, I think, remember I told you we'll be hitting 10 billion people, already 8 billion, 10 billion people there. And I also told you we don't have physical land to bring into production. We have physical land, has, arable land has been exhausted. So everything has to, you know, actually it's going to decline in the future with uh, urbanization and other things, actual mm -hmm. physical land. So everything has to happen with the intensifications and the yield increase there. Okay. And one of the component, I know I am not a proponent, opponent of GM curve as a scientist, as an economist, when I look at it, it's just, it's a tool we use to develop a new varieties or new things there. And you look, you need to look at the pluses and minus, what are the positive and negatives? The positives is, you, you know, you have GM curve, so for example, uh, GM brinjal, uh, you know, which is not, which is released in Bangladesh, but not released in India. Because India, not no GM cup have been released so far. But if you look at the GM brinjal particularly, mm. the whole reason is that uh, it reduces the number of pesticide applications in the GM cup. Mm. You know, you have a huge, you know, health benefits right there at your right now. Mm. If I'm eating a brinjal with lot less pesticide in the GM version of that, you know, I'm actually it's good for my health reason. But the, the opponents have been what's the long term environmental effect of the GM when you, because you are manipulating for the, the gen, genes or other things. What are the long term there? I don't know. I don't know the long term. I think to feed the population, we need to have all the tools, all the science available to us. You know, we should we should work on GM, sure. we should get it ready. I don't know which country will adopt it. It depends on the politics or political you know, environment there whether the GM crop mm -hmm. will release or not. But I think we should utilize everything to, to make our food system safe and feed the people, uh, protect the environment, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of every tools available to us. So uh, in that context, uh, do you think uh, biofortified crops have a role in fighting against malnutrition? Absolutely. I think absolutely. I think... Every crop now is, is their breeders, or other scientists are moving towards producing biofortified crop. You know, mm -hmm. I talked about potato. There's a lot of biofortified, uh, you know, sweet potato. The orange-less sweet potato is high in vitamin. That's a biofortified, high in vitamin A. The, the, the Kufri uh, Uday or UC map I mentioned, red skin potato variety, high in vitamin A. And we have developed potato varieties high in zinc and iron. And the rice also, a lot of rice varieties have been released, biofortified wheat, biofortified maize. I think biofortified crops are absolutely essential. You know, you know, you don't have to worry about the GM also. They're not mm -hmm. changing any gene or anything. So biofortified crop is a must, I think. You know, I think every crop released should be biofortified now, in my view. I don't know why, if we have the option of biofortified crop, why should you go for the long based yeah. nutrition crop? You know? mm -hmm. So uh, Sir, what is your opinion on digital agriculture? Would it be wise to combine artificial intelligence and agriculture? This, that's the future. I think uh, you accept it or not. Digitalization of agriculture, you know, you know, I mean, use of artificial intelligence, not only agriculture, all sectors. It's going to happen. I think, uh, I, you know, India, probably the bigger, the developed country to ha happen quicker. So the land holdings are bigger, they're much easier for them to automize it, uh, use artificial intelligence. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to open up in, in you know, country like uh, developing country where the land holdings are smaller and dispersed there. It will be most more challenging mm -hmm. for the digital, digitalization to happen. But it is, it is bound to happen. It's bound to happen. And the information digitalization, actual digitalization, artificial intelligence, will play key role in the future. I think that's a, also only way to attract the youth back to agriculture. I don't think you can attract a youth to go to the agriculture and do use, use a manual tractor in 45 degrees centigrade, 40 degrees centigrade. Now the tractors are air-conditioned, you know, they're automized or everything. Mm -hmm. there. That's the only way you can attract the youth back to agriculture, make it much more comfortable. Uh, sir, uh, what are your views on the role of women in agriculture? See, the, so we one of the mandate we have is the gender equity and equality. And if you look at the women in agriculture, they are they they contribute more than fifty percent, half of the agricultural labor in all country, all developing countries. 
they play huge role from planting to harvesting and post harvest okay all the tedious job not physically demanding but is very difficult planting weeding harvesting these are all done by the women you know men mostly do the land preparation you know doing the running the machine other things tractors other things there but a lot of very tedious and uh, difficult jobs are done by the women and if you look at now in the look in the current context with all the migration happening the head of the household the youth they are all moving to the cities because there is not enough they can make out of the one hectare of land they have it's not enough to make the living so women are left behind to manage the farm now so we are seeing the the increase in the uh, women farm farm manager all across asia women and they are not only agricultural labor now they are also managing farm where they know main household male household left in the there so they have to manage the farm there and uh, uh, you know so so they are very critical i think many of these things we work many of the technology we develop we make sure there is there is a gender angle there so mm -hmm. that the women can participate in that particular technology this epical rooted cutting i mentioned this is now led by the women from tissue culture to doing the cutting doing the seedling all done by the women now it's become natural for them to take it over and do it so i think they they play a critical role in agriculture particularly Uh, uh sir uh, due to technological advancement and digitalization many professions are upgrading or changing the ways in which they work in that regard what do you see as the future of indian farmers see, i have a very different view here see right now half of the indian populations uh, people are involved in agriculture there if you look at the developed country less than 1% in the us are involved in agriculture you know so as as we develop we are supposed to have people moving from agriculture to more non agricultural sector manufacturing service sector there uh, but we that 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 transition has not happened very fast in india con con compared to korea japan mm -hmm. where people have moved out of agriculture there mm -hmm. i don't know uh, for me eventually people have to get out of agriculture we cannot afford to have half of the population involved in agriculture making the decent living there with one hectares of land holding there for me eventually people have to move out do other more productive work in other sectors and less people are involved in agriculture managing bigger land holding you know you need to increase the land holding there for the farmers you need to have four five ten hectares of land for a family of four to survive have a decent living mm -hmm. that is only going to happen either you you have you have a very well defined land leasing policy so that the those people who have land do not want to cultivate they can lease it you know so they can mm -hmm. you know legally lease the land others others can uh, go into agriculture and do it because buying land and doing farming is not profitable either your mm -hmm. land or you lease the land you do it so for me they have to expand if you want to go to agriculture you have a farm of 2 hectares your goal should be i should be 50 hectares in next 10 years you know okay. mm -hmm. leasing land not buying land leasing land from mm -hmm. from the other farmers other villages there and that's the only way you can survive and make a decent living in agriculture uh, sir um, according to you which sectors of plant science research will prosper in the near future i for me all of them will prosper i, I don't i don't think i have any, any one or the other how we work in a have an unbiased up. view <laughs> no i think the for me everything is important but the breeding the breeders or the genetics biotechnology i think these are the one going to make some magical change supposed to make magical change in terms of the you know the the varietal development the speed breeding the time it takes for the breeding or the designer crop we hear about genome editing now you can develop a designer you can stack different traits and have a designer crop there i think that has that looks sounds very exciting you know uh, what future hold but i think uh, we are now working in a system approach we have lot of climate change issues uh, ground water problem soil mm -hmm. health so agronomists also have a very, very important role to play i think breeder agronomists will be very critical in the future 
Uh, sir, um, uh, how do you uh, collaborate with other researchers, stakeholders, and partners to advance your goals and outcomes? No, as I said, uh, you know, you have to collaborate with other stakeholders, not only not only interdisciplinary research, but also people who deliver uh, technology on the ground, uh, you know, non NGOs, uh, government organizations. They all have to come together to develop a technology reach to the farmers. So there are many technologies sat in sitting in the self, not reaching the farmers, because we don't we are not we don't have the correct partnership collaborations exist. I think the both public and private sectors needs to come together to make it happen. So the collaboration will be the key in terms of development happens in the agriculture in the future. Particularly, the extension system has to be changed so that the technology is delivered to the farmers, which is a bigger uh, blockade right now. You know. You know, reaching these uh, millions of small holders who are dispersed everywhere. You know, uh, sir, I have uh, two uh, last questions uh, that are in particular interest of the uh, students and scholars. Uh, so, when you hire a person to work with you or join your team, what qualities do you look for other than academic qualities? Listen, I don't even look at academic certificate. I, you know, I think that's true for for many recruiter, many people who are looking uh, looking staff there. I think it's if you if you ask any recruiter, they think your college degrees basically tells you that you are disciplined enough to do achieve something. You are asked to get the degree, you got it. That means you have some discipline there. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there is nothing happens in the college degree. But everything happens your experience. You know what you have done, where you have worked. For me, when I when I recruit people, I look at field experience. How much connected you are, the type of the work I do with the technology dissemination, scaling up, delivery, mm -hmm. is your farmers uh, working with the farmers in the field level. Mm -hmm. That's key. In the, if you are in agriculture, just working in the laboratory, probably the very upscale, upstream researchers will do that. But for me, everything I look uh, with the field experience you have. Even for a breeder, who those who are working on in the scale lab also, I feel if you are just a breeder in isolation and working, you may not be productive. You need to know what you are producing, whether that will be demanded or not. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then you have to reach out to the farmers. You need to be connected to the field there. You need to know actual demand, what farmers want. So mm -hmm. for me, the, the field experience is very important. And finally, uh, sir, do you have any words of advice for the students and scholars who are new to the field of plant science research? Right. So as, as I said uh, earlier, that this is a this is a sector which there will be no downtime for this sector. Other sectors kind of go up and down, you know, the either manufacturing or IT or anything. They move, but these sectors we always need food. We'll, we'll you know, mm -hmm. there is no downtime for food. There's always off time. Always we're consuming food very staple. So the demand is very staple. Right. You don't have a unstable demand. You know that next year we need to produce 500 million tons of rice. We need to produce this amount of potato to feed the 8 billion people. Mm -hmm. I'm talking global sense there. So there is no downturn, downtime, downturn in this sector there. Very stable sector. And, uh, I, and, and a lot of things needs to happen to this sector. This sector has been fallen behind compared to other sectors there. I think next 10, 20 years will be very exciting, as you said, uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. dig dig digitalizations, all these things, all this, you see startups are coming left and right, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the egg startup, uh, FinTech, all these things there. So you'll, you'll be seeing exciting stuff in terms of uh, agriculture, how the supply chain is going to develop, how the production will be done, mm -hmm. production aggregation, all these things will be very exciting because we have millions of smallholders there in terms of so i think this sector for me is the future i think anybody looking at this sector first you have a satisfaction of making somebody's life better then you also make a decent living so you have two things you are doing which is not there in other sectors probably thank you sir um so now i will just check if uh, Shubha, are you ready with the questions? Are there enough? Que I mean, there are questions were coming in. So, uh, please, Shubha, go for the highlighted question first. Then okay. I will ask a few questions. Okay. Are they in any order, or I can? No, choose? no, no. You can choose. You just start from. 
beginning. Okay. I, you 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 told me ask me some question in the beginning. Should I answer those some of those? Uh, or those not in yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, we are uh, collecting three questions from YouTube, and Soma will ask you that okay. same. Question. Those uh, two, three questions that you first introduced are they in the list that you have given me. Yes, that is the last four part, okay. and it may be combined. It's everything is there because okay, I'm. What are you? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just start from the top. Uh, that starting from the top. These are the actual real question from the YouTube, and I ask other G's to sir. So I think uh, if you cover this question, then automatically cover those. Okay, sure. So let's see. Uh, Giljit uh, ba uh, Baltistan asks, how CIP can contribute for improving yield of mountain areas, keeping food insecure areas of North Pakistan and adaptive research? Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, the many varieties... Uh, they are now developed by the scientists, sheep breeders. They are, they are suitable for the mountainous area there. Uh, you know, either in Nepal, parts of um, Pakistan, or parts of India in the in the hilly region there. So there's a lot of focus and a lot of poverty also. There's more prevalent of poverty in mountainous area there. Uh, there's a lot more poorer people there, mountains there. there. So we're working with, uh, you know, Uttara, we are now entering Uttarakhand, you know, where the potato cultivation happens very high hill area there, huge amount of poverty. But the, again, the, 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 they are still growing these old varieties, 50 years old varieties there. So varietal replacement, very important, exposing them to new varieties, preserving some of the land races. For me, very important when I work in the mountain area, there are many land races there. They have been growing for decades, you know. So they need to preserve that. Their value chain needs to be developed. So that they get higher price. Now they're not getting good price for their produce there. They should be getting higher price. If you come to Delhi in the oxygen, you'll see uh, the land race, the, 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 the variety, the big size Uttarak from Uttarakhand potato comes selling 40, 50 rupees per kg there. So developing their value chain very important, you know. So that's what we're working on developing the value chain. So the next question is from uh, Supriya Laishram. Uh, sir, can we grow potato in hydroponic system? Will it get more profit compared to the uh, production ratio in normal growers? So growing potato in the hydroponic uh, is you can grow it a lot of seeds, you know, but but making it profitable for you will be very difficult. Right now, the the hydroponic uh, aeroponics used for producing seed. Starting material, then you multiply in the field there. But growing hydroponics potato just for selling in the market as a table potato, uh, you have to sell it for, you have to have a consumer niche, consumer where you can convince them to buy potato for 100 rupees per kg. Then it's okay. Then you can grow potato, it looks very beautiful, hydroponics in the systems. And, and there are, you have to have the con consumer base to sell it. But you cannot just sell it in the market. You have to have a completely separate supply chain values in chain there, where you have to convince the consumers that it's worth buying 100 rupees uh, hydroponic potato there. Otherwise, you cannot just sell it in the market. That's not good enough. So is it possible to grow the entire potato, I mean, harvest it from hydroponics? Yeah. Okay. If you look at the aeroponics, also done same way you harvest, you just harvest it, just lifting the shaft there. Same okay. thing, you can grow potato hydroponics. Now they're growing seed, starting material seed using yes. hydroponics. Okay. Uh, then uh, Usama Wahid asks, uh, nowadays there is a concept of potato growing bags emerging. Uh, kindly brief a little bit about it. Potato yeah, I've, you know, okay. yeah the, the potato growing bag, I've seen, you know, they, you grow potato, then they're going to harvest it. There's a hole there underneath that. Okay. Uh, you can do that in some of the urban, urban farming or, you know, rooftop farming. A lot of people are doing that. Uh, not only potato, it's true for all crops also, which you can do in the bag and do it. It's a technique. Technique. Okay. Uh, then uh, Jal Jaspal Singh Naul asks, uh, Sir, can you please share about orange potato? I, I actually call the orange flesh sweet potato. That's not a potato. That's a sweet potato. Uh, Sir, uh, uh, sorry for interruptions. Actually, uh, he is a journalist. So I just put these questions one again for you that uh, maybe some journalism activities are there. So. 
No, I think uh, I mentioned orange in the context of sweet potato, sakarkand, we call it. Yes. Uh, the, so orange potato also there in our gene bank. Orange color, skin, it's a flesh, a purple flesh, uh, you know, black potatoes, everything is there. But uh, we are, they, they have not been introduced in the subcontinent or in Asia also. We mostly consume Irish potato there. Hmm. But normally, if when it's an orange, means it's a high in vitamin A, you know, but just with the, the things. But we have orange flesh sweet potato now, which will be released in India this year or next year. Okay. Then Neil Namesio Baliwag asks, I don't know what I'm doing to the names, but please excuse me. He asked, what is the highest yielding potato germplasm of CIP? And uh, he is from Philippines, actually. Okay. okay. About what I'm many, doing of, many of the sheep lines uh, it grown in, in you know proper way and with quality seed, you can get yield up to 40 to 50 tons per hectare. The, the one I mentioned, Kufri Uday, you see map, the red skin one. Farmers are getting around 40 tons per hectare. Our, our average yield is in India is around 24 tons. And if you look at in Gujarat, many farmers are making 40, 50 tons per hectare. So your variety, production practices matters a lot in terms of the quality seed and production practices matters a lot. Getting high yield, your growing condition. Then we have uh, Krishnanda Engel. Uh, can we use Speed breeding technology to hasten the vegetative growth of potatoes to foster the generations. Yeah, I think a lot of the speed breeding is done across the crops. All crops now are done speed breeding. I think our entire CGR system are following speed breeding to reduce the time taken for varietal development, other things there. Uh, yes, it, it can be done. Okay. Uh, um, I'm continuing with the question, Shubha. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, there, uh, there are two, three questions like uh, feasibility of tomato, potato and tomato. So I think it's uh, a fancy things, not uh, a marketable product or uh, this type of, but uh, uh, one, two, two people are asking for your opinion on tomato, potato plus tomato hybrids, I think. I, I really don't know. I cannot. I don't have the numbers for that. I, uh, tomato, potato. Is it two crops together, or just they are doing one crop? I, I uh, yes, sir. Actually, it's a, it's a, yes, it's a, um, it's a, what I can say that uh, you grow the tomato first, then add, uh, then add the potato. Um, plant is a, is a grafting, grafting of seeds. So, yes, so I think. I, uh, it is so of the same it, family. That's why uh, it is that's why it's uh, working and it's visible to internet, but uh, it's not visible for the uh, ground and uh, or your yeah. kitchen garden. Yes, <laughs> so maybe it's a kitchen garden or something you want to try it out. Uh, yes, but for the scale, you know, at the le field level, probably not visible. Bring it. In. We have to think of so many things about the storage. Uh, and where the and fruit it. exhibitions are there, then then people are bring to it. Uh, sir, you, uh, in, in the beginning, you have mentioned that uh, uh, slowly Europe are uh, going to produce low and Asia getting the advantage or producing more potatoes. So what will be the reason? Is the economic reason because they are exporting much uh, lower price from the Asian country or there is a real varietal problem to lower down the... It's not a varietal problem. Actually, they are still producing the amount they need but they are, they are uses and export to the rest of the world. The process, they're mostly using producing processing potatoes for frozen French fries. You know, that's the main, main way they consume it there. Mm -hmm. but, but what has happened is that the, they are in term, the, the Asia has grown. They have not grown down. Their share has gone down. But absolute amount, they're still the same. But their share has gone down where Asia has picked up the production because a lot of new varietal development in terms of potato being suitable to grow in tropical and subtropical conditions. Before, the idea was that potato is grown on the, on the hills and mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a temperate crop. That is not the case anymore. In India, mostly it's grown in the subtropical climate now. India, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. they are growing potato in the subtropical climate. 
So the adaptation of the potato, this new ecosystem, has helped supported Asia to take out, increase the production there for the table potato. There. So it's not the varietal problem; it's just the total overall production is increasing, and the you know the varietal availability is made Asia suitable for potato production. Mm -hmm. So their share is declining because their demand is less. Okay. They are they are producing how much the demand and how much the export. They can expand the production, but there is no demand there for them. Okay, sir. And uh, sir, uh, I want I really want to know that uh, if someone produces the seeds by hydroponic system and they are going to plant it in the field, then uh, the part agri ag agronomic performance and yield are the same because they are produced in the water in a different criteria and going to the field actually in the soil then. What happened to there? I just, uh, it's my personal question to you. So the, so the, so the seed, they, the, 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 the potato tubers, they produce either aeroponics or hydroponics. Hydroponics. You know, they're expensive. They're very expensive. As you showed, the aeroponics, one tuber will be four or five rupees, the small tuber. Okay. okay. Cost is four or five rupees. And they, they're, they're sold to the farmers. Let me just put the... And the, the farmers actually... Buy from the, from the facility for ten. Mm -hmm. So they are a starting material for seed production. So you need to multiply several mm -hmm. rounds to make it viable as a seed. Mm -hmm. You know. So the we when we when we grow hydroponics, aeroponics, we don't look at the size. We look at the number. Mm -hmm. How many how many tubers you are getting because that will multiplication happens. But growing, growing potato in aeroponics and hydroponics and consuming it, it doesn't, you know, it's very expensive. You can do it, but as I said, you have to pay huge prices for that. Yeah, actually, and sir, it's also for my personal uh, point of view that I wanted to know your point of view on a concept like uh, storing and uh, the because as you know the farmer are not getting the actual price but potato uh, product from the potato it maybe is a fried or maybe is a chips they are the main companies uh, those are marketed well in the world so uh, how they bring these things from the farmer is there any multiple middleman is there or is there anything what government can change to reduce this middleman between that and directly uh, help the farmer to giving that international market so they can get the funding. What is your opinion on that? Yeah. Remember I told you one of the models we are approaching doing now is a small farmer large field. Basically it's a collective action. We bring two, three hundred farmers together to do it. But the whole, you know, we talk about these farmers not connected to the market, but we are looking at if you have a hundreds and thousands of farmers dispersed and everybody has a small amount of harvest produced there. It's very difficult for them to connect to the market. So you will see the aggregator coming in between who aggregates this stuff. If yeah. I am working for PepsiCo, Haldiram, other chips company, suppose, mm -hmm. and I want to get those tubers from the farmers, I'll go to aggregator. I cannot go to thousands of farmers yeah. Obviously. To, to do that aggregator. So one way to avoid that thing and get farmers higher price is either through FPOs. We have the FPOs now, which does the collective action there for their members there. Or somehow you produce mass, you know, your volume production has to have volume to attract the buyers. You, somehow you come together to get rid of the... Uh, community farming concept. Community right? farming, you know, group farming, those type of things. You, you farming differently, but you are joined together to sell it in the market. To attract the buyers there. No, exactly. So, uh, and sir, last, uh, I just wanted to know is look like very interesting, like the Haralu concept system. So, is it working in uh, every country or is it very specific to uh, India or uh, is, is it the reproducible model for another country too? Yeah, it is a reproducible model. Right now, it's only for the one state in India. Yeah. It's yes. only one state. Her is the Haryana. It stands for Haryana. Her yes. alu is the Haryana alu. So if you look at what it is, is when farmers buy potato seed. This is only for seed. We are also doing only for the seed, not for the tubers. Okay. Only for the seed. When buy the seed there, 
there is no guarantee that what this seed uh, traceability other things where it is produced how it is produced what are the virus content there there is no guarantee of anything farmers you know so this one gives that guarantee to the farmers that you can trace the uh, where it came from who is the original producer how many times it has been cultivated under what conditions so it gives assurance to the farmers so it's a har alu any any haryana producers can participate in the program follow the recommended practices and get the logo and it is issued by the government not the private it is issued by the government we develop the system with the working with the government and we are trying to replicate that in odisha mo alu odisha mo is very famous so mo alu is something where our idea is to encourage uh, seed producers to emerge you know because we want to decentralize the seed system so if there is certification system there farmers can be guaranteed that their produce their seed will be sold in the market high price there so mm. this certification guarantee system needs to place there yes it can be replicable so we are replicating in different place okay uh, sir uh, that's all um, that's all it's a great webinar and many appreciations are there in the live chat Uh, and it's all, all, also available i think uh, during uh, you can see at uh, the webinar at any time uh, and sir uh, i have personally interested when you come next time we shall meet you because uh, cool. right now i am in ils so uh, bhuvneshwar so we can uh, I, and if you go for the field please knock me <laughs> oh, <laughs> i will I, go i, I have the office there i have the staff we are working on a big project in odisha okay so definitely for the green uh, that that uh, uh, where the uh, actual productions are there is uh, i love to visit sure. uh, I'll, uh, I'll, please I'll, let I'll, me know i i'll come with you and uh, thanks uh, once again sir because uh, you open uh, our eye in many other aspects because we are purely dealing with the varietal development but now today we are very Uh, happy that what happened after then how much time are taking to the actual field how much people are interesting on that what is the real problem and uh, sometime which problem we are uh, uh, taking uh, or looking actual this is not a real problem the real problem is different like right. seeds is a main real problem price is a real problem storage is a real problem uh, and obviously we should keep uh, trying to more uh, customize plant or uh, tailor made plant for the uh, in focus of global warming and uh, others all so thanks everyone and thanks you sir for uh, giving this wonderful lecture is a uh, very very relevant to the point and many people also told that comment that is very relevant to that time this lecture yeah obviously because uh, as you know from journalists to farmers all are coming to listen and they are yeah. i think they are very happy for today's when it is not so much plant science uh, yes. it's yeah. actual related and uh, i love to i love to hear your uh, thoughts and slides are very prominent and data driven so it's great great lecture and obviously you are a great speaker uh is i uh, love to and uh, i follow you in a linkedin and you also very update up to date about ed, ed, everything so uh, it's it's a uh, inspiration for us also as a young young scientist thank you thank you uh, good luck i think you guys are doing a fantastic job Uh, giving thanks, the platform sir. there you know connecting people uh, uh, yes sir yeah it it's connect many people in that way Correct. and uh, and it's a great uh, platform to connect people and uh, the yes. main thing is that we are independent so like yes. anybody can come anybody yes. can uh, view it in multiple times they can keep seeing and learn uh, so it is a are... good job i think it's we are doing a fantastic job I know. Mm -hmm. I would love to come back to the future sometime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, please inform your colleague also. Thank. Thank, sir. Thank yes. You. Bye bye. Okay. Care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Shoma, please stop the uh, uh, recording. Yes. I'll stop everything. the recording. Yes. Everything is should stop.